So yesterday we motivated ourselves that there is something called a qubit, a two level quantum system and there were logical levels zeros and one which were mapped to something physical and we said that let's call these logical labels as quantum states and we denoted them by zero and ket one. And we started our discussion of uh, having uh, uh, the part of a photon as our quantum degree of freedom and we drew an interferometer. So let's start off by continuing with our discussion of the map gender interferometer. And why do I discuss the interferometer? I discuss it because through this example, I can attempt to teach many concepts about quantum mechanics. So when Feynman, for example, describes the double state interference experiment with photons or electrons, he says that this is the one experiment that is sufficient to understand most of quantum mechanics. So I'm doing something similar here. I'm coming up with a, a physical experiment. It's not a thought experiment, it's a physical real experiment that could be done with beam splitters and mirrors and a stream of single photons and detectors, carefully designed detectors, and it can depict and manifest many different concepts in quantum mechanics, quantum physics, quantum information science, and quantum technology. So our scheme looked like the following. So I had uh, so two 50-50 beam splitters. So I would like to draw this properly. Just give me a second. And I had two perfect mirrors. And a single photon comes in through this path. So this input path, let's call it cat zero. So there are two input ports for this beam spreader. Either a photon could come here or it could come through this path. So I label one of the paths as zero and put a cat around it. I label this path as one and may put a cat around it. And then there are different possibilities, classical possibilities that this photon is reflected here so there's a half a probability that this particular position that this photon is reflected, it's always going to be reflected from this perfect mirror. And now on this beam mirror, there are two possibilities again, either reflection or transmission. Here, one possibility is that the photon here is transmitted. Therefore, here it's always going to be reflected because this is a perfect mirror and once again at this beam splitter this photon could be either reflected or transmitted. So there are four possibilities in total. Two possibilities at this beam splitter and two possibilities at this beam splitter. And there are two output ports and at each output port I place a detector, a single photon detector. Now, so it happens that if I were to perform this experiment in the lab with single photons, which means just one photon comes in, and I would to do this experiment, everything is neatly set up, and I ignore all false positives, true negatives, all kinds of errors are ignored, then only one of these detectors clicks. Classically, you would imagine that both of these detectors have a 50% chance of clicking because there is either reflection or transmission here and either reflection or transmission here and we know that the photon cannot be split. In linear physics, most of physics is linear, under normal circumstances a photon cannot split. If you put in one photon, one photon comes out unless you are talking about something exotic like nonlinear optics. Okay. 
So the photon cannot be split. You input a single photon, either of these detectors clicks. Let's call one detector 0, this detector 1, this part is labeled as cat 0, this part is labeled as cat 1. So the probability that the part 0 is taken up could be 1 and the probability that the part 1 is taken up is 0. This means 100%. So there's a 100% chance that the photon ends up here, the single photon. And if we really would like to ascertain these probabilities, we have to repeat the experiment many times, correct? Because if you just have a single coin and you want to decide whether it's fair or balanced or biased, you would have to flip it multiple number of times, start over again and see what probabilities come out. So if you really want to make sure that you're talking about probabilities, you have to do this experiment with single photons many times. So you have one photon, you see whether the detector, which detector fires. Then you have another identical photon coming in, identical part, identical initial condition, and see where it lands up. So in order to determine in an experiment probabilities, you need to find out, you need to repeat the experiment multiple number of times. That's the nature of quantum mechanics. But if you were, before you are able to do the experiment and you want to predict which detector clicks. That's called an a priori probability. Then quantum mechanics can tell you, can tell you for certain what the probabilities are. Alright, so this is the nature of, the probabilistic nature of doing experiments in quantum mechanics. You get this point. Now how is this possible that if we put together and assemble two random bits, two random objects, one after the other, the outcome is so certain that it's not random at all, it's rather a definite outcome on this detector. It's very strange. So this can be explained by a concept called superposition. Now remember that uh, we are assigning quantum states to parts. So our relevant degree of freedom here is the path a photon takes. That's our quantum property that we're looking at. We're not concerned with the polarization of a photon or other properties of a photon, the orbital angular momentum, etc. of a photon. Just looking at the path a photon takes. That's our quantum degree of freedom. We, that's out of which we are building this quantum device. Okay. So now what we would like to do is, if you look at this interferometer, anything that you're doing, you, you're not interfering with the experiment itself, you're letting the photon take its entire course, come into the beam splitter, you're not doing anything before the second beam splitter, the photon runs its course in this area and only after the second beam splitter, when the apparatus has ended in a sense, you have two measurement devices two detectors. So you are relegating your entire measurement, your entire detection to after the experiment has taken place. Okay? So you're not trying to be uh, over smart and you're not trying to find out which of the paths the photon is taking. That's very important. So your measurement or detection is right after the interferometer. That's very important. So there is no detector in this region, in, in the inside the interferometer, they are only outside the interferometer. Now what is going to happen here is, how do we describe this uh, counterintuitive result? Classically, classically, if I were to place a detector here and a detector here, then this detector will click half of the times and this detector will click half of the times. So this is a totally random object, but you don't have detectors here. You have positioned your detectors right after the second beam splitter. So what's happening here is that this physical object, this beam splitter, is taking this quantum state and doing something to it. What is what it is doing is 
that it is applying a transformation. So in quantum mechanics, you have states, and then you have transformations upon the states. For example, people uh, who are fond of computer science might like to think of gates. Does anyone recognize what kind of gate this is? Not it's a not gate, it's an inverter. So if I were to make a truth table for this gate, and I lived in the Boolean space in which only zeros and ones exist, and if this were my input, and this were my output. If I input 0, logical 0, the output would be 1. If I input 1 here, the output would be 0. So this is a logic gate, a transformation describable by a truth table for this device. We can also have other kinds of, of gates. For example, we could have An exclusive OR gate. Okay, so an exclusive OR gate also has a truth table. It has two inputs. So those inputs could be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and one output. So, and the property of this gate is that the output is 1 only if either of the inputs is. 1. Otherwise, it's 0. This is an exclusive OR gate. So these are truth tables and gates. So what these gates do is that they take certain inputs and give certain outputs. So gates implement a transformation. In physics, we generally use the word transformation instead of gates. In quantum computing, we also use the, the term quantum gates. So what this beam splitter is doing is that it is affecting a transformation of on this quantum state. It's a quantum gate. This beam splitter is a quantum transformation or a quantum gate. So it must be describable by a certain truth table. And the truth table for this beam splitter is the following. <coughs> So one kind of beam splitter would do the following, it would take input ket 0 and if you have a beam splitter, let's call it bs, a new state is created. It transforms the input state into a new output state and that output state is strange, it's really a superposition of two quantum states, 0 plus 1 ket 0 plus ket 1. All right. Now in order to describe a, a gate or a transformation, you have to see what it does to all possible inputs. So if you want to describe a NOT gate, just specifying one row would not be enough. You would have to specify what it does to the orthogonal input, to the other kind of input. So we need to describe what this beam splitter does to the orthogonal or the other kind of input which is ket1. So here we are making a definition of what the beam splitter does. What this beam splitter does to the orthogonal state is that it creates a similar looking superposition but with a minus sign here. And the reason why I put this square root 2 in, in the denominator, so th there's a coefficient here, 1 over under root 2, there's a coefficient here, 1 over under root 2. These are the C0 and the C1 that I mentioned or alluded to in the previous lecture. Here C0 is 1 over under root 2 and C1 is minus 1 over under root 2. So through this truth table, I define what happens at the first beam splitter. The second beam splitter, if it's identical to the first beam splitter, it's going to do exactly the same thing, whatever input you feed in with. So you are inputting a state and you are creating a superposition out of it. Alright? Now, in, 
in quantum computing or in the language of quantum circuits, this kind of gate is called a Hadamard gate. Hadamard was a mathematician, so why is it called a Hadamard gate? We'll explore later when we look at this entire picture from a linear algebra perspective. So the Hadamard gate, the beam spinner, implements a Hadamard gate. And the Hadamard gate, if you would like to use generic language in quantum circuits, represented by cat H. So and cat, oh sorry, represented by H. And what it does, it does this. So this is the transformation that the Hadamard gate implements. And in our physical example, in our physical example, this is being executed by a beam splitter. There could be other physical examples of the Hadamard gate as well. If you look at other degrees of freedom, other quantum degrees of freedom, the Hadamard gate would be implemented commensurate with that physical technology. Here, the Hadamard gate is being implemented by a beam splitter. So now what we could do, that circuit at the top, interferometer is a physical device and we are toggling between physical picture and a generic picture. Generic picture means a general picture, a mathematical picture, many different physical, it can take many different physical forms. Alright, so now what we would like to do is analyze why is cat 0 coming out and cat 1, why is there zero probability of getting cat 1 at the output. So what we would like to do is we would like to trace the path of a photon as it goes through the interferometer and seize the two beam spaders one after the other. So our input state or initial state that is fed into the interferometer and state in the quantum state, I don't want to use the word quantum again and again, is get zero. So after the beam splitter number one, what happens is that that photon exists in a superposition. Get zero plus get one over and root two. Now let's try to attach some physical meaning to this by looking at the interferometer. So what this means is here there are two paths the photon can take and remember that the photon cannot be split. However, let's call one path cat0 and the other path cat1. So what does cat0 plus cat1 mean? It can either be, either is not the proper word. What really is happening is that the photon exists in both places at the same time. The photon is really a quantum field. And the field is spread out in the interferometer and you cannot attach a path to the photon. The photon is in, in, in a simple words, is taking both paths at the same time. It's taking both of these possibilities. It harbors both of these possibilities. The only thing is that you're not measuring which path the photon is taking. You're letting it do what it desires. All right? So the photon is really a quantum field. The field is spread out. Just like an electron has a wave function that can be spread out, if you look at the hydrogen atom and attach orbitals to the electrons, these are wave functions, they're spread out over the atom. You cannot precisely pinpoint the location of the electron. Likewise, in this example too, the photon will have a field or a wave function that is spread out in both of these paths. And the only thing is that you don't want to find out which path the photon is taking. You let the photon run the course of the experiment. All right. so, so the photon really is in a superposition quantum state which is described in this manner. And what happens at the mirrors, nothing special, it just redirects and steers the path of the photon 
Nothing interesting happens at the mirrors. Okay? Even if something did happen at the mirrors, it's happening identically at the both parts, so we can ignore it. And at this beam spitter, let's see what happens at this beam spitter. Let's first look at it from a in, in this language of gets. So at the second beam spitter, quantum mechanics by its very nature, at least the kind of quantum mechanics we are dealing with, is linear. Linear means you have an input, you get an output, you have a sum of inputs, you get the sum of outputs. That's what linearity means. So now the beam spitter is, second beam spitter is applying a transformation on this input state as well as on this input state in parallel. In, this is quantum parallelism. So it's doing a transformation in parallel on both states which exists inside the superposition. So this 1 over 1 over 2 is just a constant. So I can <coughs> write this, factor this out. So if I were to take cat 0 and input this into a beam sphere, what would my output be? Cat 0 plus cat 1 plus this plus just carries over here. And what happens to this cat 1? Cat 0 minus cat 1 over and root 2. So this is my output quantum state after the second beam spitter. And I could just, this just goes away. And I am left with cat 0. It. So now what's happening is if this path would get zero, this detector is going to click with a hundred percent probability, and the photon, the single photon, will never end up here, barring experimental errors or inaccuracies. It will never end up here. So what we've done is we've input a photon in a quantum state, a superposition has been created and the only thing is that we're not aiming to measure what the superposition is. And at this beam spinner, the two possibilities are interfering. Just like a wave experiment in which you have two slits and waves are passing through those two slits and they interfere. And at certain locations on the screen, the amplitude is always diminished, you get destructive interference at certain points and constructive interference at others. So this output path is destructively interfering. You, you never get a click here. You always get a click here. All of the time. So if you want to repeat this experiment over and over again with freshly prepared identical photons, all of them in the state get zero, you would always get this detector to click. This is the simplest quantum computer you can think of. Why is this a quantum computer? We're going to explain why. Yes. Uh, so you are assuming that you have 50 50 beams So if it is not 50 50. Abdullah, can you put this as a homework problem? Right. So if this were a 30 70 beam spitter, what would happen? G. Uh, sir, why is the get one treated differently like there is a negative sign and what does this mean? If there were not a negative sign, you wouldn't have any chance of destructive interference. So this negative sign is really important. Okay? Uh, can we have an explanation on the diagram like no, this is how the action on the beam spitter is defined. And this action gives you that result. So this is how we define those... The action of a beam spitter. So let's try to modify this experiment a little bit. Any more questions about this? Because it's really important to get this correct. 
Yes. So how are you going to be certain that the photon is in the cat zero state? Because you do the experiment. And when you do the experiment, this is what you get. So if you have uh, repeated the experiment number of times, the photon will be of the other part. It doesn't. So your arbitration is done by experiment. It doesn't. <laughs> Yes, you can do either. So if you choose cat 1, I think so, yes. So you can in, try out this experiment out with different initial states. Now let's do a twist to this and that will answer all of your questions. Suppose I repeat this experiment. Now what I would like to do is, in this part, or uh, just to keep things simple, in this part, I put in some medium, <coughs> some piece of glass, some other kind of medium, right, of a particular thickness, and repeat the experiment. So now what's going to happen is the following. A photon comes in, I'm hypothetically drawing the path the photon takes. I again have my two detectors, D0 and D1. This is my output port cat 0, my output port cat 1. Now define the action of the beam splitters. I have inserted in one of the paths another object. That object could be some transparent medium that does not absorb the photon but lets it go through. I need to define the action of this medium. It's another quantum gate, <coughs> another quantum transformation. Okay? And I define the action of this gate through the following. So, what it does is that it takes input cat 0 and does nothing to it, right, just does nothing to it, okay, it lets it pass through without any change to its character, without any change to quantum state, this new object, let's call this object and I'll tell you why, let's call this object a phase, a phaser, okay. P H A S E R, not to be confused with P H A S O R. It introduces a phase. And to get one, it gives get one at the output, but it adds a coefficient T I phi. E is for I phi. A complex number. Where phi is real, this thing is real. So E of E is for I phi is a complex number. All right. Now what I would like you to do is, here a superposition is created. My input state is cat zero. My input state is cat zero. My initial state. After the first beam splitter, I have created a superposition. I'm still not making any measurement here. I'm not making any measure anywhere before the second beam splitter. So I let the photon, whatever field it is, it possesses, I let it pass through unhindered, untouched, unobserved. Okay? I let it do what it wants. And I now need to incorporate the effect of this phaser. So what this phaser does, does it do anything to get zero? It doesn't. So, just want to put this one over and do two here, right? And to this cat 1, it adds a phase, a coefficient. Now you will understand the power of those coefficients that I've been talking about. Okay? So, this is what happens after the phaser. So, the phaser is also a quantum gate. 
could be represented by this box cat phi oh sorry phi takes an input gives an output a quantum gate and remember all of the gates that we're talking about here are single qubit gates you take one qubit input and one qubit output okay now what would happen after the second beam straighter after the second beam straighter the field of the photon is this this is the quantum state of the photon though you're not measuring it by the way you're letting it pass through the second beam straighter now let's do a simple calculation we know the truth table of any beam straighter plus E i phi correct so in the next step we just expand this out So in the next step, I do something really cheeky, something just for for the fun of it. So I simply factorize out this number just for the fun of it. You realize why I'm doing that? Then I would get e i phi by two. Plus e plus e minus i phi by two minus e i phi by two. So here cat 0 has picked up this complex number and cat 1 has picked up this complex number. So what is this complex number equal to? It's actually a real number. It's cosine phi by 2. So let me write this out. I have E i phi by 2, a phase factor, amplitude 1 just a phase, cosine phi by 2 cat 0. What is this thing equal to? Sorry. Minus, sorry. minus sorry. 2 iota, right? Yes, sir. Sin phi by 2 cat 1. Sorry. Minus iota, right? Sorry. Minus iota sine phi by 2. Now I have a new quantum state at the output. So this is the quantum state that exists over here just before the detectors after the second beam straighter. Okay. Now let's make sense of it. Let's see what the measurement outcomes are. Let's see which of these detectors is going to click. Now, I would like to introduce another concept, and that is the meaning of these complex amplitudes, of these complex numbers. If this is a quantum state, of course it's in this general form, C0 cat 0 plus C1 cat 1. Both of these are complex numbers. This is a complex number. This is also a complex number take into account this factor as well. The first thing that you would like to do is in quantum mechanics you can all only measure the probabilities of outcomes. 
So I ask you the question, what is the probability that detector D0 clicks? That's a legitimate question for a quantum computing experiment. You have to ask the right questions. So the right question to ask in a quantum information class or a quantum computer to a quantum computer is, what is the probability of a certain outcome? That's a good question. So the probability of measuring of measuring the photon coming out in the channel zero or the probability that the detector D naught clicks. Let's denote this as probability with the argument zero. Let's call this state cat phi, cat psi. You call it whatever we like get psi. So the probability that the detector zero clicks is given by what is called an overlap of this quantum state with the quantum state that corresponds to the path zero, which is get zero. So in order to uh, elaborate this a bit further, this is basic quantum mechanics. So if I have a vector, say vector A <coughs> and another vector B, simple vector calculus, vector mechanics, I want to find out how much of A does B contain. So what would I do? I would take the dot product. I would take A dotted with B. So I would find out the overlap between these two vectors. I'm exactly doing the same thing over here. I have this, sorry, it's confusing on the map. So I have this quantum state, psi, and I want to find its overlap with the output state, get zero. Okay, so I take the analogous function to the dot product in. So the dot product exists in Euclidean space. I want to see what exists in quantum space. This is called the Hilbert space. That's called an inner product. Okay, so this is also an inner product. So I take the inner product of this quantum state that has been achieved after the quantum computer, after the interferometer, I find its inner product with the state corresponding to the outcome which I'm trying to find the probability of. And if I want to find the probability of zero, I find the overlap or inner product of my quantum state with, so I, let me just first write this down. I want to find the inner product between get psi and get zero. And that inner product in bracket notation is, I want to find the inner product and do something else with this, I'm going to explain that in a minute. So that inner product is given the symbol cat zero, and with this I write bra zero, cat psi and bra zero. So there's a, another line here corresponding to the bra, but I don't draw the two lines, I just draw one line. And then this is another complex number. Probabilities for probabilities, I take the modulus squared of this complex number. This will be the probability of whether the detector zero clicks or not. Now, how do I find the inner product? In order to find the inner product, I need to know that get zero. I need to know, know a few rules. The rules that I would like to present in front of you is that if I have cat1 and I find the inner product with cat1 which is represented by this bracket, this inner product, the inner product of cat1 with itself is 1. This is a rule. The inner product of cat 0 with itself is also 1, right? So if I have a quantum state cat 0, 
I know it's cat zero and I want, if I were to measure it, it will always be in cat zero with 100% probability. And I also would like to present to you the idea that the inner product of cat zero and cat one represented in this fashion would be the same as if I interchange these cats and this is going to be zero. This means that cat zero and cat one are orthogonal. <coughs> so in Euclidean space this would mean that the two vectors a and b are perpendicular to one another in 2D space, in flat Euclidean space. But in quantum mechanics, this rule breaks down because the space you're dealing with is not 2D Euclidean space. It's another space called the Hilbert space. So with these rules, I would take this quantum state cat psi and find its overlap with cat zero. What would the what would be the overlap equal to? Forget about the modular square. It's going to be this number, right? Cosine phi phi by two with this phase. So if I were to take this output state psi and find its overlap with cat zero, which means I form this bracket, I will get ei phi cosine phi by two. Finally, the probability of detector zero clicking will be the modulus square of this. What is this modulus square of this equal to? Only for once in this class, I'm also going to show that there is an e minus i phi. Because when we take the complex conjugate of a complex number, you have to change the argument. This just goes away, this vanishes away. It disappears, extinguishes. So the answer is cosine squared phi by two. And the probability that detector one clicks is the overlap of cat psi with cat one modulus square. What would this turn out to be? <coughs> Sine square phi by two. All the iotas cancel out. It's going to be probability always com comes out as a real number. This idea of finding the modulus square is a postulate by Born. Max Born. So this turns out to be sine squared phi by two. What is the sum of these probabilities? One. one. If I did not use the one over under two factor, these probabilities would not turn out to be one. So in order to comply with physical reality, the probabilities must be conserved. Now I give you one or two minutes of silence to think about this and then we'll continue. Just two minutes to think what's going on here and then I have a lot to tell about this. All right, so the lessons I would like you to appreciate are the following. The first thing is that if you look at the quantum state, the coefficient C0 and C1 can be complex numbers. Can be complex numbers. And these complex numbers have a property that if you take one complex number, find its modulus square, take the other complex number, find its modulus square, 
and add, you will get 1. That is required if the sum of those probabilities add up to 1. The sum of those probabilities have to add up to 1 because these are only two possible outcomes. The photon cannot go to a third, it cannot wander off to any other path. It has to be projected onto either of these detectors. Yes? So, so when we add the modulus square of this, so first property that you observe is if you take psi, any psi, any psi that you like and you find its projection on itself define the modulus square of this, this has to be equal to 1. This means that the state is normalized, which means that you are looking at the quantum state and you are measuring the quantum state to be in its quantum state, you will always get uh, the same output with 100 percent probability. You cannot get 90 percent probability. If you have an input quantum state psi and you measure it in psi, the output has to be 1. Right? So this is the normalization <coughs> condition, which, which means so, <coughs> which means that c naught mod square plus c one mod square equals one, and this is something you can prove. So prove this, right? This is basic quantum mechanics. You can prove this. Now, what is the meaning of just the amplitudes? The probability amplitudes for a long time was believed they don't have any meaning of their own. They only have to be modulus squared to give a meaning. And that's what happens in most of the cases. 99% of the experiments that we do in the lab or in technological implementation, that's what it means. But sometimes you can do clever experiments and find just the amplitude itself. But for that you need to do what are called weak value measurements quantum weak value measurements, so which allow you to directly image the, the complex coefficients. Okay. Uh, so one thing is that this normalization condition has to be satisfied and that's why I put the under root 2 in the beginning. And if you recall the examples that I uh, presented of superposition, I had 1 over under root 3, then I had 2 over under root 3, and I chose those coefficients because take the square of this, 1 over 3 plus 2 over 3, that's 1. The other thing that you observe is that this particular guy, this guy, doesn't really matter. Because if you take the modulus square of this, take any overlap, uh, it just washes away when you do the amplitude squared because the conjugate of this is the same number with the minus sign and you multiply this with its complex conjugate get 1 just get 1 right this has an amplitude 1 so this is just a phase now, phase so do you call this side people no I call all of this get side what is C0, C1? That's a different thing. That's a different thing. That's from my previous discussion. So this thing here doesn't really show up in your measurement outcomes. This thing I would call in this course a global phase. A global phase doesn't really matter in measurement outcomes, which means that from the perspective of measurement, from the perspective of measurement, psi equals the same quantum state with a global phase, right? Because both of these states will give the same measurement outcome, unless you're doing something clever with geometric phases or Berry phases. You're not going to talk about. All right. So global phases, 
phases are immaterial. The states have to be normalized. And now you have a recipe to measure probability outcomes. Probabilities of different outcomes can be measured. So what we've done, what we've achieved in one breath is the following. The state must be normalized. <coughs> We've also known that global phases are mostly immaterial. And we've also noticed that uh, this phase here really, really matters a lot. EI phi. It's a relative phase between two components of the superposition. EI phi. If you look at this example here, what is phi here in this example? It's pi. EI pi is minus 1. So this, this relative phase between the components of the superposition is what makes this interferometer and any quantum computing experiment really, really interesting. Koi bhi five le do, koi bhi alpha le do. Any alpha, right? Any angle. So, ignorant. So, relative phases matter. And they matter quite a bit, right? And we also have a recipe for finding probability. So probabilities are you overlap the quantum state with your desired outcome, let's call cat beta modulus square. This gives you probabilities of an outcome beta given a quantum state psi. And if I were to do an experiment, so probability 0, and here I plot probability 1, and on this axis I plot 5. Suppose I were to repeat this experiment, this interferometry experiment with a phasor in between, and I would repeat it in such a manner that I can tune this phi, I can change this phi. For example, if this is a medium which is an electro-optic medium, an electro-optic medium gives you a different phase with a different electric field when it's applied to it. You change the voltage, the phase changes. So if I were to do an experiment in which I were to tune this phi, what would P0 look like as a function of phi? What will the graph look like? So I'm tuning phi. I want to find out how does the probability change with phi. What is the probability? Maybe in one week. Cosine square phi by 2. So let's, what does its plot look like? That's what a cosine square phi by 2 looks like. Where this I think is, uh, this is pi, isn't it? Pi by two. And this is pi by, this is pi by 2, uh, no, this is pi, and this I think is 2 pi. Because it's phi by 2. And the probabilities are always positive, as they should be. So, doesn't this look like interference fringes? Yes. They do. So, I change phi. I can control and if I were to plot this probability of observing on detector 1, I would get a sine square 
5 by 2. This is the top one is cosine square 5 by 2. So I can by tuning phi I can determine whether the photon ends up on detector 0 or it ends up on detector 1. Just like interference fringes. <coughs> so this experiment is an example of a quantum interferometer. So we've seen quantum interferometry as well. By the way, these probability curves are like seesaws. One goes down, the other one goes up. So the sum of these curves is always one. So we have a quantum interferometer. And when we say quantum interferometry, <laughs> interference, what, what is interfering here? Hands up. What is interfering here? Yes, please. Parts of the photon. The parts of the photon. The two parts, the two arms of the photon are interfering with one. And it's just one photon. And it's not that the photon is either going on either path. The photon is everywhere. It's on both paths. But these possibilities, these probabilities, these amplitudes are interfering. It is exhibiting its wave nature or quantum field nature, yes. You can also link this up in quantum field theory. This is Feynman's sum of histories, yes. You want to ask a question? No, no, okay. So this is quantum interferometry as well. So we've done all of this in one go. Now I would also like to introduce to you the concept of representing these quantum states. So, oh yes, don't forget, don't forget, we've also been introduced to the concept of quantum gates. <coughs> and we've seen the Hadamard gate, <coughs> we've seen a phase gate, <coughs> and in any quantum ex computing experiment, what generally happens is that one follows the, the same scheme. You initialize, initialize your quantum computer, then you do a set of transformations, and finally you have interference. The two possibilities are interfering here at the end. Some outcomes have a higher probability, some outcomes are suppressed, and finally you do a measurement. And you want to do all of this in a fashion that no measurement takes place in between. All the measurement is relegated to the very end. And when you do a measurement, the superposition collapses. If I were to do a, put a detector here, this superposition here, this thing, this thing <coughs> would just wither away. It would either get collapse into cat 0 or cat 1. Suppose I put a detector here. Let's do this thought experiment. I put a detector here, D3. If this detector clicks, it means that the photon is found here. And when it's found here, nothing happens here. Because the photon has already been given up all its energy to detect and disappear. So this act of measurement is demolitive. It demolishes the photon. So it's a demolitive measurement. It demolishes the photon. The photon has some energy, HF, and when it falls onto the detector, all of that energy goes into an electrical pulse that this detector produces. And it's gone. You have to get a new photon now. It's lost. So it's a demolitive measurement. So if this detector clicks, nothing is going to happen at these detectors. They will remain empty, vacant, bare. However, if this detector does not click, and you know that the speed of a photon is equal to the speed of light, and you wait for some time and this detector hasn't clicked, it means that you can expect a photon to come on either of these detectors. And when that happens, this detector is going to click with a 50% probability, and this detector is going to click with a 50% probability, that interference goes away, because you have blocked this path. You have blocked this possibility. You've already collapsed the superposition over here. 
the superposition no longer exists. So if you are trying to be over clever and say, okay, I get interference. Interference is because the photon is taking both paths. So let's find out which path the photon is taking. And if you try to be over clever and put a detector here to find out which path the photon is taking, then the interference collapses. So there is mutual exclusivity between the path, the which path information and interference. So in one go, I also talked about Bohr's complementarity. Complementarity means the which part information, which part? I need to write this word. Which part information and the interference? They are mutually exclusive. If I were to see interference, I would have no information of which path the photon has taken. It's gone to both parts. And if I were to be over clever and I want to pry open the interferometer, open it up like uh, a child on his birthday wants to open up his presents before the guests have gone away. And if, so if I want to do that, I will get information about what present exists, which part the photon takes, but I will have forgot, uh, given up on the opportunity of seeing interference. So which part and interference are mutually exclusive. They are complementary to one another. And if you were to talk to Werner Heisenberg, Dr. Werner Heisenberg, he would say that the position and the momentum are incompatible observables. Right? He would say that delta x <coughs> Delta P has to be greater than some baseline value. So which path is X and interference is, you can imagine this to be due to momentum of the wave that is associated with the photon. So X and P are incompatible observables. I want to find out X, which means I want to diminish this. This thing has to go up. So the uncertainty, the momentum goes up, uncertainty in the k vector or the wavelength goes up, interference disappears. <coughs> so this one example has somehow shown us all of these seven things. Now in the last 10 minutes of this class today, I would now like to talk a little bit more about quantum states and see how they are represented. So far, we have focused our attention on a single qubit only. One qubit, the simplest thing. And in order to represent these qubits in quantum information science, there is a very nice uh, picture that one can make. So that picture is of a sphere. This sphere is called the block sphere. Block sphere. G. Udar sine square thi phi by two other to the pitch root of this. You could also try putting in a as your initial state a superposition state to start off with. Instead of cat 0 or cat 1, what if you input cat 0 plus cat 1? Yes. If 
if there, this were a phaser in between, right? If there were a phaser here and this detector does not click, you will get E I phi or zero. Zero, nothing will actually happen to zero. <coughs> this phase will be immaterial here because it's going to be a global phase. So ye le lete the photon just extinguishes. There's nothing to look at. And there's another twist to this experiment which is called quantum erasure. We can, after the interference experiment has taken place, we can still do something really clever and recover the interference fringes. So we, we might talk about this delayed choice experiment later, but it's very foundational. Anyway, quantum states, psi, <laughs> psi, live on the block sphere. The block sphere is a surface of this sphere. Just a surface. In terms of mathematics and differential geometry, this is called S2. This is just the surface of the sphere. And if you want to define, okay, let me just draw these fiducial lines just for clarity, okay? This is, let's call this equatorial plane. It's not the earth, but let's just call it for pedagogical purpose, the equatorial plane, the north pole and the south pole. Now, if you want to define a point on the sphere, uh, how many parameters do you need? Three. Three? Go on, go on, the, the radius of the sphere is one. Two. You need two, right? You need two angles, theta and phi, the polar coordinate system. Now what we uh, say that is on the north, north pole lays the quantum state at zero. And its orthogonal state lays on the diametrically opposite point here, south pole. This is just convention. Now in flat Euclidean space 2D, get uh, zeros and one and two orthogonal vectors are orthogonal. Here these orthogonal vectors live on diametrically opposite sides of the block sphere. Okay? Because it's not the Euclidean space we're talking about. Alright. Here, you have another quantum state which is now superposition of ket 0 and ket 1. This is towards you. This is on the equatorial plane facing towards you. This point is ket 0 plus cat 1 and an equal superposition. There has to be a 1 over an under root 2. It cannot be 1 half because the sum of these complex coefficients modulus squared should be 1. Okay. <clears throat> At the diametrically opposite point, there is the quantum state cat 0 minus cat 1 over under root 2. And you can check that these states are orthogonal. You can just take this ket and find its inner product with this ket. How do you do that? I want to do that once. So I get ket 0 plus ket 1. This is my overall quantum state and I want to find its overlap with the bra associated with this. The dual of this. That will be ket 0 plus get 1 over and root 2. <coughs> okay? So each one of these labels then goes in the corresponding bra. And if I were to use the rules that I put on the top, top right and use the linearity principle, this will be equal to 0. No. Either? Q? This is just a bra. This this sign will not change. Uh, this will not change. This will not become minus. A phase. If there were a phase here, e i theta, that would be e. This were minus i theta. Okay. So this point is diametric. It's the orthogonal to this superposition. Yes, Abdullah. Sir, uh, I think the point I'm trying to make is that if you want to do dot product of the x, the plus state and the minus state. Then the probability would be zero. The dot product would be zero. What you have done currently is just the dot product of the plus state with the. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. You have to state here. 
ठीक है सॉरी बिल्कुल ना दिस पर्टिकुलर स्टेट ओवर हेयर वॉट इज दिस इक्वल टू जीरो प्लस आईओटा कैट वन और कैट जीरो प्लस ई आई फाइव बाई टू कैट वन सेम एंड लाइक वाइज आई कैन फाइंड दिस वट अबाउट स्टेन ओवर हेयर सो ऑल राइट लेट फर्स्ट लुक एट दिस स्टेन ओवर हेयर ऑन दिटोरियल ट्रेन एट एन एंगल फाइव लेट कॉल दिस एंगल फाइव एज यू मुथल एंगल फाइव Just as you do in, in your polar coordinate system, this state over here is going to be cat zero plus e i phi cat one over and root two. Here phi is zero, so this is cat zero plus cat one. Here phi is ninety degrees, so get e i phi by two, which is iota. At the back, you get phi equals pi, so this is. Cat zero minus one. So you are on the equatorial plane. Cat zero plus one. You move. So with cat one, you get a phase phi e i phi. Here you get phi equals ninety degrees. You get cat zero plus iota cat one. Move back and so on. Right. So by looking at this angle inside the sphere phi, the whole the azimuthal angle phi, I can trace out. Where all the states live on the equatorial plane, and I can find their expression. The general expression would be this. But what about a state on any other point of the sphere? In order to do that, I need to define this, this angle here. So this is becoming slightly crowded and messy. So let me redraw this box here. I have a point here, anywhere on the sphere, which is defined by two angles. One angle is this azimuthal angle phi, and the other angle is this, called the angle of co-latitude theta. And this point, say, is. Some point on the block sphere, and it has a quantum state ex expression cat zero, and here lives cat zero. Here lives cat one. Can you, looking at these two angles, can you identify to me what would the coefficients or the probability amplitude of cat zero? What might they look like? What should I write over here? What should I write over here? जी ये बात आई थी तो विद जीरो आई नहीं शाब्दिक तो दिस इज कोसाइन थीटा बाय टू And here, sine theta by two, e i phi. So you look at this quantum state. You look at the different position of the block sphere. The states map out out to this particular form. And if I were to take the bra of this, just for completeness. This would be cosine theta by two, bra zero, plus e minus i e phi, sine theta by two, bra of one. So all of the quantum states corresponding to a qubit can be pinpointed to any one location of the block sphere. On there are eight octants of the sphere. 
on any object, Samne, Aage, Piche, Kahin, Be, Be. And how many states can live inside the block sphere? Even though there are two basis states, so this is the first time I'm using the word, there are two basis states. Cat 0 and Cat 1, which means that any quantum state corresponding to a qubit can be expressed in terms of these two basis states. Anything with the appropriate coefficients. So, even though there are only two basis states, that's why it's called a two level quantum system or a qubit. How many states uh, do we have in front of us that can live on the block sphere? Infinite. That's why there is an infinite possibility of quantum states that can live even within two dimensions. All right? Because theta and phi are continuous variables. And if I were to put a global phase with this, right? I can put a global phase with this, some e raised per i, anything, alpha. That's not going to change the position of this state. It's going to <laughs> still be here. If you want to do something complex as in geometric physics or geometric quantum physics, you would just put a fiber bundle there, but nevertheless, it's still living on the block sphere. And on the surface of the block sphere, inside the block sphere, there are other states that are called mixed states, but we will postpone this discussion to later. And what you could do, just a minute, what you could do, take any two points exactly opposite diametrically, find the theta and phi for those states. Phi will be this phi plus pi, and theta will be pi minus theta. You bake those replacements in here, you get a new state, and then find the overlap of this state with this state and get zero. So orthogonal quantum states live on opposite sides of a string that connects on the two edges of the diameter. So all quantum states live on the block sphere. And the block sphere is a really nice concept because most of quantum mechanics and quantum computing can be described if it's for a single qubit. What the beam splitter does, or the, or the Hadamard gate does, takes this input, get zero, and shifts it to the equator. Produces get zero plus get one. So quantum states live on the block sphere, and quantum gates or transformations are movements, rotations of the block sphere. So we'll advance this concept further in the next class. So thank you very much.